Okay, so we will continue with the uh, second lecture on the machine learning. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I hope the microphone also works. I guess so. Otherwise, I think I'm no, it's not as it work. I'm speaking loud enough, I thought, but okay. Controls to control room is checking, taking care of it. So yesterday we had some basics about Bayesian neural networks. As you remember, today we have two lectures, this one hour now, then a little break to resettle your brain a little bit, and then we continue. It will essentially be one big lecture, I would say, about generative models. Um, I just shortly discussed with Casey that after the school, my write-up will be uploaded also. So if you don't want to write, you don't have to, but I always advise to do so. For what reason? Because the moment if you look at the blackboard and see what I'm writing, and you have to copy it yourself. The information has to go through your eye, through your brain, into your hand, which means that it passes at least once your brain, which is a good thing. So maybe it's not too bad to write, write up everything yourself. Okay. And we start with generative models. Before we go into any detail about the different variants of generative modeling, we first have to ask ourselves, what is generative modeling about? What we usually are interested in, or we have, is we have some distribution, which we are interested in, which I call p-truth or p-data of x, where x is our feature space, no matter how we describe it. High energy physics, this could be four momentum, but it could be also any other representation, depending on how you want to represent your data. Further, given this, we're interested to sample or generate new data, which is following this distribution. So how do we do this? So the question is, we kind of need a model to, which kind of first needs to learn what the underlying distribution is. So it's, it's called generative modeling. So generating new data points is always directly cross-linked to density estimation. So often we first need to estimate what is the density we're interested in, which links to the fact on how can we represent P. There are two ways. P can be given either explicitly, which means I have it given as a function, which could, for instance, mean it's the cross-section, the differential cross-section. Or the amplitudes or whatsoever. <laughs> On the other side, and that's, this is kind of a thing which is kind of an advantage for us in high energy physics often, because we have quantum field theory, which means in many cases, we know, or we at least have a good estimate of how the true probability might look like. For other scientific researches or general mon uh, machine learning applications, that's not always the case. There, you rather often have the other part, which means you have it implicit with a, via a set of data points, which are following this distribution which could be just, for instance, a set of images and you want to find this distribution in order to generate from it, so generate new images. So, but as I said, in the end of the day, it's a physics goal, so we're not interested, I mean, it's still interesting topic to talk about generative modeling for new images, and that's very fascinating what to get out of that, but in the end of the day, we want to apply it for high energy physics or generally physics, not just particle physics, 
But since I'm a particle physicist and theorist, I'm mainly interested in that part. So what are the parts where we would like to apply it? There are various options. For instance, you can do event generation, which, is, which will be one of the examples I'm going to show you later. Then you can also use it for phase space integration, which I will not talk about today. Um, some of you have attended my seminar on Friday there. I talked about that, and I think maybe Tillman will cover it also in his colloquium. But I'm not going to give that example just because there are too many examples possible. Um, people more interested on the experimental side, we all know that doing these very complicated detector simulations with Gian 4 are very, very expensive. So one hope we have is this generative modeling with machine learning is very, very fast. So one idea is replace this very expensive modeling of Giant with some fast simulation, fast detector simulation. For instance, you can use it to simulate a better calorimeter response or generally detectors. And quite some interestingly, which you will also see often, even though we are simulating the process from, let's say, pure, from, we're starting from some mathematical assumption, going to some feature space, we actually have observables we can compare to data. This is kind of only, the only reason why we're doing that is because that's the way where we have, how we have, how we have our data represented, right? How we have our measurements, which means whenever we want to compare our data to new different models. For every model, we have to do the same simulation step again and again. So what has been long around in an idea of people is, can we not do it the other way around? Starting from our given data measurements and undo the simulation, which comes under the name of unfolding, and bring this back onto the level where I can directly compare this to our measurement. So that's the last thing, or let's say the Last thing I want to mention, because of course there's still way more other possibilities. One other possibility that I'm not mentioning here, but you will see tomorrow, is you can also use generative models in the inverse direction, which means for density estimation, for using doing anom anomaly detection. So I'll talk about that tomorrow in more detail. So I'm, I put it. I could have put it on the list, but I didn't here. So. Generally, all the simulation is intrinsically a stochastic process. What does it mean? This means whatever we do, our input to our generative model should be somewhat random. So we need some random number generator which means we usually start with some input, which is some pseudo-random numbers. And then what we do, let's assume we have the space, which we usually refer to as latent space in generative modeling or machine learning, which has some given distribution. Most of the time, we use something which is simple. Why are we using something simple? Well, because we want to be able to sample from it very, very easily. So most of the time, this is either just a Gaussian or some uniform distribution. It has two advantages. I can sample from it very easily, and I can easily write down a distribution because it's simple. Then what the generative model is doing, it maps this onto some other space, which is our in space of interest, which I call p data. And this mapping is what we're interested in. So we have some mapping f theta of z, okay? Where our x is obviously f theta of z, and this should follow this distribution. That's what we're interested in. Okay, 
So what we actually want, okay, let me be more precise. X follows some distribution which is given by the model intrinsically, but what we want to achieve is that this matches P data. So that's essentially our task, okay? So the question is now two ways. First of all, how do we construct such a model? And second, how do we train it? There are quite some models around. I just want to mention some of them before going talking about them in more detail. One of the first people who have in mind, which is not like historically the first one, but you will see later on that the way I'm going to introduce it, it makes more sense to start with them, are generative adversarial networks, or short for GANs or GAMs. Second, which were actually historically the first one people were considering, because they have a, in principle, very simple structure, are so-called variational autoencoders. And in machine learning um, community, not very new, but at least in particle physics quite new, let's say in the last two or three years only, are normalizing flows. Which I will spend almost one hour, at least a try to just on normalizing flows because there are nowadays for most applications kind of the state of the art of generative models. And also very useful because you will see later on, they give a possibility to give an explicit density description. There are of course more models than that. There's more simpler versions like Gaussian mixture models. I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, there's also some new variant coming up, which we kind of see everywhere these days in the machine learning community, which are so-called diffusion models. I'm not really have time to talk about them, but I know for sure that Tillman will mention it in his colloquium because there are not so many particle physics papers out there which already use this, but in one of his papers they, are, they used it and he will mention it. So we kind of, um, yeah, talk with each other what to cover. So possibly you will hear about everything. Not in that much detail math-wise about this part, but it's not that, not that relevant. And of course, there's any kind of hybrid version of combining these things. You can also use, again, combined with a variational autoencoder, combined with a normalizing flow, whatever you can imagine. So that's, of course, always possible. But let's start, before we continue introducing any of these models, how do we know, once we have a certain model trained, if it's a good model or not? So let me first start with introducing some metrics and how we can determine whether a model is useful or not. So there are also many, many, many options. I'm just going to mention some of them, but the list, of course, continues at some point. One of the first options, which should be familiar to you since yesterday, is let's assume we have both P model explicitly given, or let's say you can parameterize it with your model, and let's assume you also have P truth or P data given, which is difficult in the case where you consider generative modeling for images because there you have no, no idea, but you use it for high energy physics and you wanna, for instance, model differential cross sections. This is something you can write down and calculate, right? At least depending on the difficulty of your order you wanna calculate things. You can at least write it down. Maybe you cannot write it down as an analytic formula on one page, but at least in principle you can compute it. Assuming we have that, remembering yesterday, what is one way of measuring if two probability distributions are alike? Does anyone remember something from yesterday we had there? 
Exactly, we have the KL diverge, it's perfect. So we can use the KL of P model and P data. Sorry. Often, actually, I'm going to explain you why. just repeated what we already had yesterday and I'm also going to add another line. So this integral in terms of an expectation value, because that's what we always can most of the time do because we always have like a set of data points so we can never do the actual integral. So we always have to express things in terms of expectation values. This means it's the log of P data over P model given the data points distributed according to P data. Okay? So, as I falsely wrote down first, of course, what you can see here, in principle, I'm allowed in the KL divergence to interchange these things. So, I could also put P model here and P data there. But if you look at the definition of the KL divergence, it's not symmetric, which means I would replace this expression the other way around, it looks in principle similar. It, you think it's just taking the inverse of that thing, which is true, but for taking the expectation value, in this case, you need to have samples which are coming from the truth, which is always the case in machine learning applications. If you have it the other way around, you need to have samples which you have generated from your model which of course is something you also want to achieve because you want to have a generative model. Depending on which direction you, you choose, it's sometimes referred to as reverse KL divergence or the other way around. And they have different properties on how they push things into certain directions. There are of course also other variants, uh, uh, other options of comparing um, probability distributions. So for instance, one thing I just said, it's not symmetric. And because it's not symmetric, it's also per definition mathematically not a metric because a metric needs to be symmetric. But in principle, you can also write down a similar thing which is symmetric and is also per definition a metric, which for instance is the so-called total variation. I just simplify it now with P and Q. And this half is more or less some standard writing and you just take the absolute difference between P minus Q. What you often also find in the literature, instead of having the KL divergence, you can symmetrize it, right? In principle, you can take this one plus the interchange option and then divide everything by two. This one is always referred to as Jensen Shannon divergence. So it's the symmetrized version of that. So you think it might be a metric. But it's actually not because there a metric has more ax axioms to fulfill, not just symmetry. It also must fulfill triangle, the triangle in inequality, which is not true for the Chanson uh, Shannon divergence, but this one does. There is, of course, a bunch of others. So I'm not going to mention all of them, but there's a very nice, I think, math or statistics paper. So if you're ever interested in finding any other divergencies, there you can look it up. And it really depends sometimes on how you construct these divergencies, because in principle, it's also possible to use these things as a loss function on how your model optimization works, where and how you push things in which direction. Okay. The next thing I want to mention is um, shortly that often what we are doing in particle physics is we just generate events and then we look. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean we generate a bunch of events. I mean, of course, for, for images it's easy. You're there you can say, well, I'm just generating a single event, 
image. And then I can just look at that and use my own eye, if possible, to judge whether this is a good sample or not. Of course, a single event or a single image makes sense, but a single event in the particle physics context doesn't really make any sense because we know, or at least we, we know that the underlying uh, theory is quantum, right? Which means everything goes with probability. So a single event doesn't mean, us, mean anything for us. So what we have to do is we sample a lot of points and then we end up, because if it's 10 dimensional, I have very hard time to imagine a 10 dimensional thing in my brain, but maybe it's just me. So what most of the people are doing is going using histograms <laughs> or distributions and look at them and compare how good they align with the truth. But of course, this is not necessarily the best estimate because depending on which distributions you look at, you might miss correlations or something like that. Then there's a third one, which I wanna mention explicitly just because I also know it will go show up again, is the so-called classifier test. This is actually not that new in the machine learning context, but quite new in the particle physics context. And there, there were just, just two papers out actually working on that. One was with Ben Nachman and me, and the others were Tillman Plain and David Sheen collaborators where we explicitly use the information of the classifier to judge how good the model is. And so one of the papers is this old math one. Then there is this, sorry, latest one from David Shee and friends. And it seems I forgot to write up my own one, but it will show up later on. The idea behind this is here. Let's assume we have generated events which are truth and wrong. Like we have some true data and some wrong data. Let's say generated data. And as you've already learned in the second lecture, I think, about how you do classification, you can train a neural network classifier to distinguish between this generated data and the truth data. And what we know, let's assume, this is, a, this is a strong assumption, which is, let's say, the problematic part about it. But just for math-wise, we, we know if this classifier reaches its optimum, then there's a math statement from the Neyman Pearson lemma that this classifier exactly yields the log likelihood ratio of both things. So it's the optimal estimator. So if you train your classifier C to optimum, what you get out is P data of X divided by P data plus P model. Okay? This is very helpful. <coughs> and the statement goes even further. If and only if C equals to 0 0.5, which means it's completely confused, then P data equals P model. So that's very cool. So we have something which is in principle very, let's say, um, yeah, you don't need many assumptions to, to do this. But of course, there's this one big but is all of this holds only under the case that the classifier has been trained optimally, which of course is generally not always easy, okay? But if we would be able to do so, then we have a really good possibility to get a good estimator. There are, of course, a bunch of other options 
to, um, which I just want to mention. One is the so-called um, Earth Movers Distance, also called EMD, which essentially describes if you have the most way, the most simple way to understand it is, let's assume you have two piles of dirt, which look differently. And the Earth Movers Distance describes what's the minimal cost by shipping around dirt to transform one of the piles into the other one. So this is also something you can also generally apply to probability distributions. The only problem with this is the aim, these earth movers distance becomes very, very expensive the moment you go away from one dimensional distributions, which makes it most of the time not really practical for our applications because physics probabilities are intrinsically high dimensional. Sorry? Sure. Well, this means that no matter what input you put, like no, no matter which event you set in, the classifier has no idea if it's so Yes, it becomes a constant. If it would be optimal, then yes. Which of course is most of the case not true. Most of the time what you will get is something like, and I think Twimmer will probably show plots like these. You have 0 0.5, and then you have something which peaks around that with some width. But of course, if it would be perfect in the ideal world, this would be just a line at 0 0.5. And the, the worse you know the classifier is, the broader this gets. So if it's your classifier is very bad, you get something like that. And, but then you at least have the hope that it's kind of well calibrated and it still peaks upon 0 0.5. It's a very, very bad classifier. You have something very, very broad and it's not even peaking around 0 0.5, then it's like doing something like this. And then you better look into things again, what's happening there. But very good question. And then there's also other things like maximum mean discrepancy, which I also want to mention now because it will show up later. Which is also very simple. I'm not going down into the formulas here, but the idea is that you have two samples and you essentially take the pairwise distance across the different samples and then scan over it with a kernel. And this is also very simple in the idea, but also becomes very, very expensive in scales with the number of samples, which means if you have n samples to compare with other n samples, the time to compute scales with n squared. So if you, the more samples you have, the more expensive it becomes. And of course, then there's definitely a bunch of others which I didn't think of or I didn't mention. So if I left anything out which pops into your mind, this might be the dot, dot, dot here. Okay. Are there questions so far about that? Yes. If I understand the question, if you can train a neural network to train a classifier. Yes. I mean, it, I mean, I think there were quite some stuff now in your question, so I'm not going to answer all of it because maybe some of it will be answered anyways on the fly. But generally, if you combine your classifier training with anything else, like for instance, the gun training, which I was just going to introduce now, things are more complicated because there you not necessarily want a classifier be, to be optimal because otherwise your entire training crashes. So that's also one of the problems. 
which I will mention in 15 minutes, I guess. So. so if I did not answer your question fully yet, maybe wait until I've introduced the gun completely. And then if it's still there, you can ask again. So the next thing I want to talk about is one of the first models I mentioned, which is the generative adversarial network. They became quite famous at some point, first of all, because of their very nice idea. And second of all, they were the first models which were able to generate realistic images, which were often by eye not distinguishable from the other set from the training data set. And how do they work? So the idea is very, very simple. And in my point of view, very, very beautiful. So you train two neural networks against each other. So they're in competition. It's like two players playing chess. You have one network, which you call a generator, which essentially serves as our generative model, which means it does the mapping Z to X. Then you have a second network which you either call discriminator or classifier or adversarial network. So there are multiple things how you call it. Usually it's short form of D most of the time. And this is now trained on your generated data and the truth data and tries to distinguish between your truth and a generated one. And usually it's like associated some number. So it tries to get the class zero for everything which is generated and one for everything which is truth. So what you do here is essentially what I just described in order how to quantify the quality of a model. So you have some generative model and you use this classifier metric in order to train this generative model. So how? Say it again. No. So what you, I mean, there are quite up to the question was if it's just one observable or certain things. So in principle, you're free to choose what you put in your discriminator. But what you would like to do is at least as cover as many features as you have decreased the freedom because you want to at least discriminate entire data set. Well, you can also have multiple discriminators, but you can also have one discriminator which gets, which gets a high dimensional input. It's not discriminated on a 1D observable. It's discriminated. It gets the feature X, which it gets as an input, can be 10, 12, whatever dimensions it is. But of course, you're right. As I said, yeah, a lot of hybrid versions, you can also combine multiple discriminators together. But that's always possible, starting from some basic thing, and then you can add. So how do you do this in practice? So you need a loss function. So you still need to write it down. So what you do is on one side, you have a loss for a discriminator, which is essentially the binary cross entropy we also saw yesterday for standard classification. Let me shorten the P model as P theta. And the idea is discriminator tries to minimize this loss because it tries to be good in distinguishing. Okay. On the other side, the generative model, of course, wants to optimize this thing. So it wants to maximize this. Okay. But of course, you can simplify the loss function a little bit 
because only here, where you sample from P of theta, the generator part comes into play. In this part, where you sample from data and you put it in the discriminator, the generator is not part of it, which means if you take gradients with respect to any parameters of the generator, this part will drop out, which means if you want to separate these things, the generator, the generator tries to maximize this thing. Often, like, I mean, mathematically, it's well defined like this. Now you have two problems. First of all, that's, that's more like by construction, all machine learning frameworks are set up in such a way that it does, minim does, that it does minimization, not maximization. But that's quite simple, right? How do we get a minimization out of this? Well, we just change signs and make a plus out of it. That's very simple. Another problem, what people found out, and I, later on I will show you a plot for that, is even though this is mathematically well defined, actually computing gradients of this is not very beneficial because in the beginning of the training, when your generator is very bad, you get very small gradients, which makes your training very, very slow. But you can show that mathematically equivalent, so this gives you kind of, a, let's say, bad gradients, And what you can mathematically show, it's better to instead use log D of P theta. So this means you want to minimize the generator in order that the discriminator misclassifies. So you do the opposite. Instead of saying you want to, you want to make sure it is, let's say, maximizes its good classification, you minimize its misclassification. So you go the other way around. Even though mathematically they're the same, this one is preferable if you do numerical optimization. That's why you do that. <clears throat> okay. For those of you interested, that's what I missed. The GANs have been, in, let's say, invented and found by good fellow and friends in 2014. And there's this very nice paper, which actually, if you look it up on archive, is not even from 2014 anymore because there's several iterations on updating things and I think they are at version seven at least by now. But it's still a good read to get into things and how they initially thought about everything. <clears throat> okay, so how do we do the training? For the training, this works. I mean, in principle, you wanna, would like to do this simultaneously, but that's actually very complicated. So what you do, you do it iteratively. So you first, I mean, it doesn't really matter with what you start, but one option is you freeze your generator. I'm gonna explain a little bit what that means. Then you train your discriminator on both batches of real and generated data by minimizing this loss function. The next step, you freeze your discriminator, and then you train your generator to minimize LG. And then you essentially iterate. I mean, as, as my, that's like essentially means one epoch is both things doing once and then depends on how many epochs you want to do. It's like a hyperparameter like any other neural network optimization. No, not at all. So the question was if standard simulators like Pythias or do something like that, these very simple and short answers, no, not at all. They don't. But we are currently about to implement several of these no techniques, not necessarily generative addressable in networks, but we try to supplement all of these generative 
standard tools with machining methods because they're faster. Exactly. An NPDF is not a generative model at all. It's just, it's a standard fitting. It's, it's more similar to what we did yesterday in a Bayesian regression, except that they're not doing any, anything Bayesian. It's just doing a regression. It's just a fitting. It's just a very model agnostic fitting. So the question is now, why do we freeze G and D here? I mean, this is very, let's say this depends on how you set up your thing. And actually, if you write down things in PyTorch, you actually not necessarily need to do this because there you actually specify which parameters you want to optimize and take gradients off. If you try to write this entire thing down in Keras, Keras is, doesn't have that much freedom, so you most of the time just write down model fit, which means it takes the gradients of everything, which means if you try to minimize this thing just with respect to D, it automatically would take gradients of G which comes into here, which you don't want. So you explicitly have to freeze the generator. And the same here, where you only want to optimize the generator part, you explicitly have to freeze the discriminator. So let me put that in brackets, where this really depends on how you actually set up things numerically. But it's a good remember still to keep this in, that while you optimize one model, the other one should stay fixed, and these weights are not altered. Okay, there are some problems with generative adversarial networks, which will, there was some group working on that, which you might um, face. First of all, you have this often referred to as minmax training. This is very unstable because in one way, if one of the networks is much, much stronger than the other one, and, the, and for instance, the discriminator is way too good, which refers back to his question, and is trained as an optimal classifier, you add a point of 0 0.5, and you, you would think, oh, that's good, because it's very good in classification. But on the other hand, you add a point where when you then try, starting from this, let's say, fixed point, try to take gradients of the generator, your, your gradients are zero. So we'll not get any gradients anymore, which will mean you have a very good trained classifier, but your generator will not change anything. So that's a problem, which means you need to make sure during training that the classifier learns something, but not too good, so that the generator is still possible to keep up and keeps on optimizing. So you have some kind of vanishing gradient problem, which as a term you already heard yesterday in terms of the recurrent neural networks, it's just a different reason here because you have this competition. Um, there are possibilities to solve that, for instance, with regularization, which might be something you have to use, regularize, or you can take a penalty on the gradient. So for instance, if you optimize your discriminator, what's often been done is you can calculate a gradient but then you want that the gradient of this discriminator is not too big, so you penalize if it's too big. In order to make sure you kind of um, artificially hamper the training of your discriminator. All of this has been justified, not by me, but by very in smart machine learning people where they were investigating how GANs are actually converging and what you have to do for this. Because even though the idea intrinsically is very, very nice, actually training the entire object is highly non-trivial. Okay. These are in a way already some ways to improve, but there are of course other ways. And people are, at least around the, let's say, 2018, 2019, 2020, there were so many papers out there back then of people trying to, like, say, optimize and publish new ideas and how you can make GANs actually work. I remember this very, very well because in 2017, when I, when I worked on GANs my, the first time, 
and try to apply this, let's say, we essentially just took the toolbox from machine learning, try to apply it on event generation, thinking, oh, it's a good idea, it works very, very nice with images, tried it on event generation, essentially what one of the exercises is about, and then used it out of the box, and we found it doesn't work. Perfect, and then it took, let's say, one or two years while constantly waiting for new machine learning papers and interacting with machine learning groups about different techniques to actually make things work, both generally by improving the uh, improvement of uh, the, the training and also make it work with high energy physics data, which is intrinsically not an image. Because one problem, and I will talk about that also in a bit, is while images where you actually have something like an idea what one event or one image is, as I said, in high energy physics, one event, unless you consider a big event in a calorimeter shower, but on a like parton level stage, one event, as I said, quantum field theory doesn't really make any sense. So you need distributions. So we actually care about the quality about the distributions. That's what we're interested in. So you need a, let's say, I would consider it as a second order of precision. The first order would be the single image. The second order is the distributions. And if we just checked quality of images, the first order quality is very, very good. But the second order, we usually don't care. We don't care if I'm, if I'm learning my generative network on a set of images from bathrooms. I'm only interested in the one sample I generate that this looks like a bathroom. I don't care if I sample one million bathrooms how the distribution of those images look like. If I would, I would also find that these distributions are not very well distributed. Okay, so what are ways to improve? There are multiple ways. The most, let's say, straightforward thing is, what about using different loss functions? One of the possible loss functions which has been around and suggested is the so-called Wasserstein, again, which is mathematically very much related to the earth mover's distance. So that you can show mathematically that the Wasserstein metric and the earth mover's distance are equivalent, equivalent to each other. And there has been two papers. The first one was in 17, where the standard GANs didn't really work and people were using this, then realizing, oh, it's a nice idea, but it also doesn't work because the problem is in order to have the Wasserstein GAN working, you, have, you need to have certain constraints on your function, which one thing is called, it has to be a Lipschitz constraint, something like that. So people were thinking about how can I implement this? And then there was a follow-up paper just three months later, which was called Improved Wasserstein GAN, I think. And there they introduced essentially this gradient penalty term which essentially helped exactly to obey this. But then on the other hand, people were very hyped about these Wasserstein GANs, and I was too in the end, the beginning, and still realizing, okay, they work much, much better than the standard GAN. But then found this paper at some point, realizing why not just using, this? I mean, people back then only used the gradient penalty for whatever reason on the Wasserstein GAN, because there they really found it's mathematically necessary to do so. For the normal GAN, if you just write down the loss function, there's first of all no mathematical strict reason why you want to implement it there. But people in machine learning and also we decided, let's just do it anyways, and found if you plug in a query and penalty in the standard GAN description, it also is way better, and it's even better than the Wasserstein GAN. And then we were like curious, and like, okay, maybe it's just happening for us, and it might be just as a, some kind of a coincidence because it's a very specific problem. But then there was also this other paper in this one where they actually have proven that even with gradient regularization, a Wasserstein GAN not necessarily has to converge, which means Wasserstein GANs are not as superior as people always thought, even though it's still a very nice idea. So another way of obeying these, let's say, doing similar things like the gradient penalty, um, because the gradient penalty is in a way very expensive. The reason for this is you have to take a gradient of your discriminator and then from this gradient during backpropagation, during optimization, take another gradient. 
which means you have to take quite a many gradients and taking gradients is kind of the most expensive thing when you, if you consider no, uh, neural networks. So the forward pass without gradients is most of the time the fastest, but taking gradients is the slowest. So if you have to take gradients twice, it slows down things quite significantly. So people were thinking about other ways and there was another way and I'm going to mention this specifically for the group which tries to work on things. It's called spectral normalization, which effectively just changes which eigenvalues your weight matrix is allowed to have. There is this nice paper which explains the math behind it. But for those of you who just want to apply it, the nice thing is you don't really have to care in a way because there's a, a, a layer there, both in PyTorch and TensorFlow, which is called spectral normalization, which you can put in, which helps. And quite interestingly, I, we were not really sure how powerful these things are. So at some point I talked to Ben Nachman, who was one of the first guys using generative adversarial networks in high energy physics, at least to my awareness. Sorry to everyone I missed. But the first thing they did were using GANs for um, calorimeters, so for Carlos, so they call it Carlogan. And it was okay, but it didn't work very well. And people were always saying, oh, guns are just not good. They were just not good. But back in the days, it was 17, there was just no regularization, or at least it was, they were not aware of it. And at some point, working with Ben, we found out if you just put in a spectral normalization, you would just improve everything by a huge factor. Suddenly, everything looks super, super smooth. So this regularization here is very, very powerful. And of course, you can also use other losses, like for instance, least square or some relativistic GAN, etc. So there are multiple options you can do. And of course, in a way, you can also combine everything Nobody forbids you to do that. But of course, the more things you combine, you always, the more hyperparameters you have. So it might also be more complicated. But in principle, no problem ab about that at all. So um, let me, just five minutes, but that's not a problem. Shortly mention a pro and a con about generative adversarial networks. So the pro is, and this statement has a little bit diminished in the last year with the appearance of diffusion models, but GANs are very, very great with images. And one of the, let's say, big shots, state of the art there, uh, is the so-called style again, which if you Google it like this, this you will immediately find, and by now they're at version three, so style again, one to three. And again, my point of view, but maybe I'm biased because I've worked on that for three years and it was my, kind of my PhD baby. Um, I like the idea, the basic, very simplistic idea of just two networks competing with each other. But of course, as we have already heard, there's no free lunch, except at the summer school in Kiosk. There's also some downsides. And one of the downsides, and I'm going to show you uh, one example, maybe shortly within the break, if you're fine with that, um, they're not really optimal for distributions. One of the reasons is that the training itself doesn't really give you any idea of the model, of the model distribution actually learning. So even though you have a generative model and in the end you kind of generate images or points from some underlying model, P model itself, or P theta, you don't have it explicitly. 
it's purely implicitly given. Which means it's also not very useful um, for density estimation because you, have, you don't have an entity. You can only sample, but you cannot write down or you cannot express it as a function. And the last thing is the loss. I just write down loss and explain it. The problem is for standard neural networks, if you train in neural networks, you can read off from the loss function if the model performance is good. So usually as a quality score for neural networks is the lower the loss, the better especially the lower the loss on the test sample, the better. But how about here? Here, this is not the case because the loss function is nothing externally actually checking how good your performance is. It's just a score of the competition between those two players. So in other words, if you have a very bad discriminator and a very bad generator, they can reach this Nash equilibrium at 0 0.5, or let's say this log two thing in this thing, but still the generator gives you very, very bad results, which makes sense. It's like if you have very, very bad chess players, they both might have a hard time to play against each other, but the overall play, chess game they play is very, very bad. And so if they now compete against Marcus Carlsen, they will probably lose immediately. So that's the problem with, with, with guns. You don't have like an overall score on how to judge how good it is. Okay. So um, let me quickly show you one example before we go into the break. Where we considered guns for um, particle generation, a little bit like this example I set it up, but a little bit more complicated. That, I'm not sure what I'm doing. That was the wrong one, apparently. So there we did TT bar production with consecutive decays into W's and then B quarks and uh, two jets respectively, so we had a six particle final state, so much more high dimensional than the problem I gave you. And because here you have two top quarks decaying into Ws, decaying further, you have four intermediate on-shell masses, which are complicated to shape because you have resonances everywhere. And while on the left, you see that the quality for just, for instance, mapping the energy distribution looks quite nicely, which is again, this, this one metric of just look, generate events in look, and there you can see that we built the, the, the ratio of those things that they're all good within 10% at least, which is back in the days was the best you can get. But even then we found if we do the same thing with the invariant masses, which is of course a very complicated observable, because if you only consider the final state particles, this is a highly correlated observable which connects the two final state and particles, then you have to calculate invariant mass of it, so it's not trivial, so that's not explicitly given in the data set. So the network really has to learn it. And this green curve here is what again gives you out if you don't help it. So it kind of gets the peak, the, the, uh, the position, but the width is way too broad. And this is something we found, and this is very, very similar. This is the reason what I mean is if you have sharp features, sharp structures, these generative, this, the GAMs explicitly have way, way hard time to find these things. Here, what you can see, so the truth is the right one, red one, you have two other curves, which means Pride, Wigner, and Gauss. This is where we helped the neural network by saying, okay, well, we are physicists. Maybe we can assume that we know something about our process. So we explicitly parameterize invariant masses of all of the external final states and then just use an additional MMD loss just to cross, to check if there's anything happening. If we added this to our loss function, then it nicely finds this peak, not to the perfect quality, but way, way better without putting that in. All right.
are there any questions? The second example I skip, but I will pick it up later in the normalizing flow part. If there are no questions now, no problem, we will have a break and we'll meet up again at 11, I think. And sure, if they're coming up questions in the break, just ask me, otherwise ask it in the next session. We will then continue shortly with variational autoencoders. I'm a little bit behind in time, but that's not a problem. I've written way too much up, but it's fine. So you later on can find it when I upload it. And just shortly introduce variational autoencoders, just the main idea, because I think it's nice to see the analogy to the Bayesians neural networks. And then we spend quite some time on the normalizing flow because we will also use them tomorrow again. All right, thanks again for now and see you in half an hour. Okay, then why don't we get started uh, for the second lecture in the morning today? Yeah, please. Perfect. So let's go ahead so we can then after that digest everything over lunch, I would say. So we already covered generative adversarial networks, which I put in this little box up here. Um, next, I rather briefly um, want to cover variational autoencoders, not because they're not interesting, it's just because they don't have that many applications in the end in particle physics. And I found normalizing flows a bit more interesting, but that's more purely personal point of view. So we'll definitely put on some references where you can look up more things. One of it is obviously when it got invented in 2013 by uh, Valence and friends, where the basic details are in. But okay, what is a variational autoencoder? In order to understand this, we of course have to quickly remember and remind us what is an autoencoder. So the idea is you have some part which you call an encoder. This is essentially a network which narrows down onto some smaller space, which is again the latent space. And then afterwards, you make it bigger again in the decoder. And you end up with X prime. And let's say your input dimension is D in and your output dimension D out. Then you construct it in such a way that the output dimension and the input dimension are the same. While the latent space here, by construction, is asked to be a bottleneck. Um, why this might be interesting, I will cover tomorrow again when we talk about anomaly detection. But the crucial thing is, you first use some input, compress it, and then you decompress it again. And the idea is to then match that the output here is the same as your input. So roughly speaking, your loss is a simple mean squared error where you have something like, well, let me write it like this. Where your output, your X prime, is given by the combination of decoder and encoder of your input. So this compression here or going down in latent space of the size is quite important because this means in order to achieve that X prime equals to X, you cannot do the identity mapping because obviously you're going down in dimensions so this doesn't work. So actually something non-trivial has to happen. So the question is now, how could we use this for a generative model? So let's assume we trained a system to match, in principle, what we would like to do. We don't consider this encoder anymore and just start from the latent space and sample here, pipe it through our de decoder in order to get a new output. So the generative model, sample Z, and then your new samples are just D of Z. Does anyone see a problem 
Sorry if I'm staying away. The problem is, so which of these statements is non-trivial? Yeah. Exactly. I wrote down sample Z, but from what should I sample? I mean, I have no idea how the latent space looks like my encoder has um, represented. So there's no regularization at all. So I don't know how to sample. But of course, there's a way to do it. And that's what the variational autoencoder comes about. It comes with an actual with a nice trick. It looks quite similar. Which effectively means in one word, or in one sentence, it gives structure to the latent space in such a way that I can sample from it. How do you do it? It's quite similar. You have your encoder again. This now is not just mapped onto some random latent space. Now it's mapped on some mean and some sigma. And this now is used to sample or represent Z, where you just take mu plus sigma times some epsilon. And this epsilon here, you can just sample um, from some uniform Gaussian, okay? And this is then piped through our discriminator to get X prime. If we do this, we can now sample from our network because we know how mu and sigma looks like and we have this. This works as long as we don't cut this part off. So the problem is the moment we cut this part off, we don't really know what mu and sigma is anymore. So in order to still make it work, we need to force a variational encoder that this mu and sigma have a certain value. So what we, actually, what we want is that it matches some prior assumption of our latent space. So let's assume our P of Z is a Gaussian. We want to make sure that now the output of the um, encoder, first of all, because now it's matched to a sampling, because now you essentially map your input onto a Z, which is not deterministic anymore. So you not describing actually a deterministic function, your encoder now, and now you should remember something from yesterday, becomes a probability of Z with respect to X. So it's very much like transforming yesterday our weights into the probability. So this represents what we called yesterday the Q part except that now, because this entire thing is a neural network, we don't have to skip the dependence on X, which we had to do yesterday for simplification, but here we don't have to do it. And then our um, denominator, and not, sorry, not denominator, our decoder equally, because it becomes an input to distribution, it's now also a distribution X of Z which is what we called yesterday px of z, okay? Now what we would like, what we would like to be interested in is finding the truth likelihood p z of x, which is kind of the inverse of this thing, which we don't have, right? but we want that the encoder does the inverse of that. So what we try to match are those two things. Or in other words, um, we try to make sure that this matches this, okay? And this is exactly what we wrote down yesterday for the Bayesian neural network. Just that now, the sampling is not over some network parameters. The sampling here is over the different latent space we are mapping to. But it's quite the same thing. So I'm not gonna repeat the entire liberation of the loss function again. I just write down the loss function. Um, 
because we know it, but if you still want to see it again, there are two things where you can look it up if you want to, even though it's the same we did yesterday, but sometimes it's useful to see the same derivation once again in a different context. So let me just write down the loss. So now we have, like yesterday, minus log of d x of z. So that was the likelihood. So that's what the thing we call yes yesterday p, right? Remember? And yesterday I wrote it with a, with a integral, but in a way, an integral in a sense is the same thing as an expectation value. So the z is now sampled from our encoder, which was the q from yesterday. So that's the same expression. So we should know that. Plus, what was the other thing we got yesterday? We already had that word today already, KL divergence of, what did I say? In order to make this work, we need to make sure that our sampling probability, so our encoder, matches our prior, otherwise we cannot sample anymore, right? So we need to have that this is this. Okay, this is the same term. Now it has a different meaning because now it regularizes our latent space so that we can actually sample from it. And this term here now, because it's a same thing like yesterday, a log likelihood, this exactly becomes this term once we assume that the output of our, of our decoder is a Gaussian. So we get exactly back what we had yesterday. Except that now, yesterday, if you remember, we had, if we had a fitting, we had HA minus HA truth, which is exactly this, if you just consider some random output here, right? And then squared, and then, of course, times some factors. Which means it has very much relation to Bayesian neural networks. And Except what I say again, now the sampling is not over some parameters, Peter, it's just sampling over Z. So that's a very nice analogy in here. So, now, let's just go to that one. What are the pros and cons of variational autoencoders? The pro is, because it's just one network and I have a well-defined loss function, which also means I can read off from the loss function if the performance is good, it's way stay more stable and easier to train. On the other hand, I have an explicit map on my latent space and back. So I have a really explicit map, that's nice. So I have something like an inverse, even just an approximate one, right? And I have an explicit description of the probability here because I approximated it with this Q. So I have an explicit QZ of X. And starting from this, which you will see later, I can also get an approximation of our full data likelihood, which is the thing we want to approximate if you want to do kernel density estimation, like some, some density estimation. But there's also, of course, cons, like always, because of this problem that it's not actually the same thing and you have some freedom on how you choose the width of your Z, they're actually not performing that well most of the time, neither for images nor for HEP applications. I would not say it's never good 
but at least to my most and most of the time I see it, it's not most of the time not optimal unless you tweak it. So let me put in rarely state of the art. So there's of course some buts, like always, because it's very pro problem specific. Also, because you have essentially like in the Bayesian neural network, you have this one part, this log p of x, which is the normalization part. You cannot calculate this, right? We cut it out of the Bayesian part, and the same is here. We also have, we're also missing it here, which means there will, there will always be some gap between our q of z and our truth we're actually interested in, the full likelihood of the full data set. So, which means there's no optimality guaranteed. And coming from that, what you always call this, you have a likelihood gap because there's one part of the likelihood, this P of X, which you cannot calculate. Or in other words, so what is missing here is this part. Right, that's the part which is missing. In other words, if you want to approximate this, because sometimes you're interested in this, what is missing in order to calculate this part, if you just reshuffle the equation, is this side. So the KL of Q of E with the PZ of X, that's the thing you don't know. Right? Because that's the thing you want to match. So there's one part of the likelihood you don't know. Quite interestingly, um, there is a, because of this reshuffling and how you write down this loss function or the thing you're actually interested in, you can actually link variational autoencoders with normalizing flows. You still don't know, or at least some of you may know, but you still don't know what a normalizing flow is, but I'm gonna explain to you. But I still wanna mention this because I won't have time to go into details, but once I've talked about normalizing flows, you should be able to read this paper and understand it, that it's called survey, which means something like subjective variational autoencoders called bridging the gap between normalizing flows. I'm also write down the archive number. It's also from some machine learning people where they find that there's a connection between normalizing flows and variation autoencoders. And in fact, this connection of normalizing flows and variation autoencoder is the same connection as you have between a Bayesian neural network and a standard normal, normal network. In a way, the normalizing flow is kind of a deterministic special case of a variation autoencoder with under certain circumstances. And the cool thing is, likewise for Bay and Bayesian neural networks and neural networks, where you have on one side, the purely Bayesian assumption and a purely deterministic thing where you have a spectrum of saying, well, from let's say a purely generic distribution, I can also have something like dropout. I can actually do the same here. I can have something which lives in between. It's not purely a variational autoencoder, but it's also not yet a normalizing flow. So that's the only thing I wanna say about that. If you wanna know more about this, I recommend you to read into this paper. Okay. There's one other example, let's say kind of the only one I know, which uses um, variational autoencoders quite in a good way in high energy physics, which, where they use it also as a generative model in both directions for forward simulation and inverse simulation. Um, it's from 21 from our friends of yes, from Jessica Howard and I'm not sure Jesse Taylor, I think. I think it's called Otis, like the owl. And I'm not gonna show up any plots, but I just still wanna mention that one. That's definitely worth looking into it. Okay. <clears throat> 
So now I want to talk about what are normalizing flows. I've already mentioned them yesterday, today, I'm going to mention them tomorrow. What are normalizing flows? So next thing I want to talk about are normalizing flows. So we have the variational autoencoder, and now we do the normalizing flow. What is the hyperparameter? The D, the acceleration Yes. It's quite sensitive. I mean, you essentially, so the question is if the latent space dimension is a hyperparameter and how you tune it. So the thing is, that you essentially check on how good your reconstruction is. In principle, you don't want to have it equally sized because otherwise it would just learn the, the unit identity mapping. And then, of course, mathematically thinking, the minimal dimension you can have is the true decrease of freedom your data set is represented in. If you go lower than this, you will definitely lose information. But of course, if it's not a physics problem, sometimes it's hard to guess what is your decrease of freedom. For physics scenarios, it might be easier but it does not necessarily mean that it's numerically the optimal solution because sometimes having a little bit more variety might still be numerically be more efficient. So that's kind of the lower part and the highest part is obviously taking the same thing and then in between, it's essentially like you do every hyperparameter optimization. You try and see how the performance is. There's no true mathematical derivation of that. Let's do normalizing flows, and because they're so important, they get their own big section. All right. What is a normalizing flow? So far, we always either didn't had any chance to get P at all, which was in, a, in the, the GAN case, there, there was no explicit description at all. In the variational autoencoder part, we at least have a lower bound, which is called, some, that's why you sometimes call it an elbow loss, evidence lower bound. There you have some approximation, but is there a way to actually get P? And the answer is yes, for normalizing flows, we can learn P of x explicitly. And I put a theta here because obviously in the end it's, it's, a, it's based on our model, right? So we have the model parameters. The idea is now the following. You have some input and some latent space. Now they have the same dimension and you construct a mapping in this direction and in this direction, which is invertible. So you have an invertible mapping by construction. Now the idea is to learn this invertible mapping between data, so this is data side, and this is some latent. So data and latent, where again, you want this latent space to be simple so that we actually later on, when we're interested in generation, can sample from it. So this is again, like before, some Gaussian or uniform distribution. And now crucially, because it's a bijection, the dimension of X is the same as the dimension of Z. Right? Otherwise, bijection is not possible. Now, how do you do that? So the nice thing is because it's a bijection, probabilities are conserved. What do I mean by that? I have some probability P of X times the volume of this thing. And because it's bijection, this has to be conserved. Um, if I consider the probability which is given on the latent space times the volume of the latent space. 
where, of course, z is just f of x. Or vice versa, x is f minus 1 of z. Okay? And then from this, I get that p of x, let me put a theta here, is p of z, which is equal to f of x, times the Jacobian, or more precise, Jacobian determinant of the f of f, the function f. And now you have everything you need in order to calculate your likelihood p theta of x, starting from some simple um, latent space distribution p of z you know, assuming you can calculate this Jacobian determinant. If you can do this, you can easily calculate this part. Okay? So now the interesting bit is we have, because we have an invertible map, now we have the possibility to go in both directions. What does it mean? It means the f direction of going from x to z is usually referred to as density estimation which we will use later again tomorrow for anomaly detection, while of course going from something simple to this side is exactly what the generative model is. So this direction is generation. Okay? Now, the question is, first of all, the, the first thing this means if we have this, well, how does the loss function look like? I mean, we are able to calculate this so we can use the most simple loss function we can use in the moment we have a tractable likelihood, which we learned yesterday, which is just the maxim, um, the minimum log likelihood, the mean maximum mean log likelihood. So we just have as a loss function this bit. So we want to maximize the log likelihood or we minimize the negative log likelihood, right? That's what I mean in minuses here because we only can do minimization. And that's cool. And because we have this very simple thing and can directly link the loss function to a statistical property of estimation, estimating this log likelihood here. That's one reason why we think, and also as machine learning people think, normalizing flows are so stable in training and so powerful. For you really have a description of your probability and you can really train and treat it as a probability during optimization which was not necessarily the case in all other scenarios, where we always had to approximate it or even were not able to express it at all. So now the question is, how do we calculate this part? I mean, we need to be able to, we need to have a tractable Jacobian. which just means it's a Jacobian which I can compute in a finite time, amount of time, otherwise it's useless. So that's the next point. How do we achieve this to get a tractable Jacobian? It's actually a little bit hand wavy because I'm not just want to have the Jacobian, I want to have the determinant of it, but I always will Whenever I speak about it, I would just say tractable Jacobian, but it's a determinant of it, okay? And so, how do we do it? This df dx determinant is, of course, the determinant of a d times d matrix if you have d dimensions. This means this determinant scales 
like d to the power of 3, which means if we have a very high dimensional problem, 100, 1000, to scales very, very badly, if you just compute it like this, which makes the entire thing super, super slow. So this has a very bad scaling. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means it's not very efficient. And efficiency is the key what we are aiming for because otherwise we don't have a fast simulation anymore for replacing something which is also slow. Otherwise we replace a slow, a slow turtle with another slow turtle. So how do we achieve that? How to fix this? Training Yeah, even after training, you have to evaluate that. Because the Jacobian is part of the mapping, right? In order to calculate this object, you need to calculate a Jacobian. I mean, okay, if you just want a sample, you don't need it because you just pass it, but for training, you need it. Yeah. And if you're interested after training in, inf in inferring P of X, then you also need it. If you're just interested in sampling events, then it's fine. But then the training is still super slow. Okay. So the basic idea in how to solve this are so-called autoregressive. transformations. What do I mean by that? Let's assume we have a mapping x to z and we have some dimensionality. So z is represented as z1 cd. Okay? Then we say z1 is only a function of the first component of x1 then z2 is a function of x1, x2, etc. And then, of course, zd is a function of x1, xd. Why does it work? How does, it, how does the Jacobian, so not the determinant, look like? So if the Jacobian is a derivative with respect to everything, so if I take the derivative of this thing with respect to, so if I take the derivative of all of these things with respect to x1, I get an entry here. But if I go down, so if I take x, z1 with respect to x2, x3, x4, I get zeros, right? Etc. So what I end up with is a Jacobian, which is upper triangle or lower triangle, depending on how you write down your Jacobian. And what do we know about the determinant of an upper triangular or lower triangular matrix? Back from math. Yeah, I think I heard some mumbling. It's just the product of its diagonal, which is nice because this just scales like D. So we saved quite a lot of time. So if this takes one hour GPU time, then this is other one is, takes much, much longer, obviously. All right. So that's, that's very cool. Of course, in the end, what you do is you're not required to have one of these mappings of x to z. So in the end, you have a chain. So you start from some x, map it onto some latent one, then you go further, do two, and so on. Let's say, z of n. So you do multiple of these plots in order to describe the entire mapping. And you know, of course, any chain of an invertible mapping is an invertible mapping again. And another nice thing, okay, we still need to, in the end, the determinant of the entire thing, but this is just a chain, 
And of course, you know that the determinant of a product of matrices is just a product of the determinant of each individual one. It's just a math statement. That's cool. For each individual blocks, we can calculate it. So we can also calculate it for the entire block. And this thing, this entire block, that's what we call a normalizing flow. OK? So now, the question is, how do I construct my transformation such that it obeys these things, this autoregressive style? Here, I, of course, I have some freedom. I'm just going to mention one possibility and then cite some others. Because, of course, in principle, here you have some freedom. Let me go into the most simple one, which are so-called affine transformation. What you do here is the following. Your Z1 is just some parameter alpha times your first x1 plus some mu1. Your z2, now alpha2 is a function of x1 times x2 plus mu2 of x1, etc. Now you can check for yourself that if you take derivatives, you really get back what we had here. So you really have an upper triangular matrix. Now, of course, since we say we have an invertible mapping, how do I inverse this thing? Well, the inversion is actually quite simple. So for xi, I just need to do zi minus mu i over alpha i. I can just write it down. Of course, there are two, ca there are two caveats. First of all, in order to be able to allow this, we need to make sure that this is never zero, right? Otherwise, we have a problem. So what you usually do, you're not, it's similar like the discussion yesterday about do I parameterize sigma or something else? I'm also just parameterizing the log of it. So I'm actually doing something like e to the s of x or whatever it is. Let's just write it like this. Now the trick is because the invertibility does not depend on how alphas, except for this log, except for this exponential here, and how mu are parameterized, these things here are now parameterized by neural networks. So these coefficients I can parameterize with a neural network and can be like as flexible as I want to. Okay. Now, of course, there's another caveat in this specific case. If we look in the inverse direction, if you are precise, x1 is z1 minus mu1 over alpha1. x2, though, is z2 minus mu2 of x1 and alpha x1. This means if I go in the inverse direction, I can only do it step by step. Because in order to calculate x2, and meaning in order to calculate mu2, I need x1, right? So I'm fast in one direction, and slow in the other direction in terms, if I have d dimensions, I need to have d evaluations in order to get in this direction. So this means if I'm training my entire system, because training usually works in one direction and sampling in the other, my training is fast, my generation is slow. Of course, I could have set it up the other way around, right? 
because the entire thing is invertible, I'm, I could also have written x1 is a function of z1, et cetera. So I could have all, so constructed the autoregressive thing the other way around. Then it's the other way. Then training is more expensive and sampling is fast. This is kind of one of the bottlenecks here. One thing I didn't men mention, which is important, is when you do this combination here of the distant blocks, what you typically do is, in between of these distant blocks, you do some permutation of your input space such that the meaning of Z1 changes. Because otherwise, this first parameter will always only be a function of one of the other features, which might be limitation in your case, right? But of course, you can just do a permutation in between because a permutation is bijective mapping, another one. So you change the meaning to make sure that maybe Z1, which was here only dependent on one other parameter, now ends up here. So you really make sure you actually catch all correlations. There's some solution. So this is a problematic thing here. If you want to say, well, what if I want to be fast both in training and in sampling? But there's actually a solution to this, which is, in a way, still an autoregressive transformation, but a special case of it. Um, they are usually called coupling block, coupling transformations. So the idea is here, let's assume you start from some x, which is high dimensional. You split it up in two parts, x2 and x1, which doesn't mean it's two dimensional. This x1 could be, so let's assume this is five dimensional. So this could be three parts and this could be two parts. It's just two, two, you split it up into two things. And then what you do is the following. You essentially keep one of them exactly the same. So this entire system of x1, which might be some combination xl, this stays the same. And you condition the other part with respect to this. So what you get is effectively something like this. z1 just equals x1. z2 is now a function alpha times conditioned on the entire block. You split it times x2 plus mu of x1. Since now z1 is equal to x1, this year, if you inverse it, it's now not a problem anymore because now mu of x1 is the same as mu of z1, right? So there's no need anymore to do it multiple times. So we are equally fast in both directions. And you can prove mathematically that starting from this very generic thing, you can construct a coupling block by setting some of these. So if you start, for instance, the affine formation by setting some of these alphas to one and others to zero, for instance. So you can prove that. Which means the coupling block is a special case of a standard, most generic thing, which makes them a little bit less expressive, but they are much more convenient often because they're fast in two directions. There are, of course, many other possibilities. I'm just going to mention some of them before I'm going to show the last 15 minutes some examples in order to use different transformations, and which are even more powerful because this is just an affine transformation. So there are obviously more options. And the most standard thing comes under the idea of piecewise splines. And there are most of the time three different kinds we use, which are either quadratic ones, which was tested in some paper from some NVIDIA guys called Thomas Müller, which is not the football player of Germany, it's just a very common name. 
at least I think so. You never know what you do, aside for playing football. Then you have cubic splines. And then rational quadratic. And especially the last one, uh, which are used most often these days, at least with our, within our research. The reason for this is twofold. First of all, they're very, very expressive. Similarly expressive to the cubic splines. The problem is that for cubic splines, you don't have an, um, an analytic inverse, so that's a bit more com complicated. For rational quadratic ones, you can write it down, which means it's faster. Plus, the other thing, these splines naturally act on the unit hypercube. And for most, let's say, my applications these days, which is transforming unit hypercubes, they're just a little bit more natural to use because you don't have to do any remappings between a real, the total real space and this compact unit hypercubes. You can naturally apply that. But of course, that's not a limitation because there's always a bijection between a compact space and the total, total R, if you want to. All right, so now we have 50 minutes, that's perfect, to discuss examples of normalizing flows, unless you guys have questions. I give you a minute to think about it while I clean the variational autoencoder part, which we don't need anymore. Uh, I have uh, one conceptual question. Um, so in this uh, normalizing flow, you have a feature space X and you have a latent space Z and your loss function is the, uh, the negative of log of the, the, the probability. So yeah. It's like a log likelihood. Uh, yeah. So then does this mean that the uh, representation of x is changing to the representation in terms of z yes exactly. so you are not changing the dimension so you are trying to uh you are trying to find another equivalent representation of the, your feature space yeah yeah yeah. so what i'm doing here i can maybe here what i'm using is exactly my change of coordinates i introduced here which means this becomes log of my latent space, which I pick in such a way that I know it, z of f of x. So I start from my x space, go in the inverse direction to get my z value, to put it into this p of z, which is a Gaussian or uniform, times the Jacobian I calculate. And then from this, I effectively get this one, which I then minimize. So I do this chains of coordinates. So the, since the dimensions are the same, so if I think of some kind of physics problems in the X space, I'm moving, I'm changing the problem, the same problem in terms of Z in, in the Z space. Is it obvious that there is another representation that exists with the, uh, the, the, the largest probability that you are uh, minimizing over there in the loss function? I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just curious whether there is equivalence representation in Z, which will give the same features as in X. Is it obvious there is another representation of such thing? Yeah, no. And the yeah, honest fair answer is it is not always the case. Um, for instance, if you think about it, if you have a Gaussian in your latent space, which let's consider it like as a some very diffuse ball in some 3, 3D, and your feature space now is a donut. Strictly mathematically speaking, there's no bijective transformation in our understanding of math to do a mapping from this topologically simple connected object into a donut which has a hole. So that actually doesn't work. Which shows you that there are cases where topology might be a problem. But there are two solutions to that. First of all, many physics applications, in our case, we first of all, first of all hope that our face, the, the space we're interested in is simply connected, so we don't have these topology issues. If they are like there, what you can also do always is, instead of using one normalizing flow, consider two of them and take their sum 
saying you map two balls. One ball is mapped onto half of the donut, the other ball on the other half, and then you take the coherent sum so that it looks like a closed donut. And then you also solve the problem. But very good question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Um, the well, both parts. I mean, in principle, the encoder part is the is the normalizing flow part. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the first example, which I really only quickly mention, is also event generation. And I'm not going to explain too much about it, except for saying what the paper is, and then later show you the plots, because it's essentially the same problem as I already showed you for the gun except that here the process is slightly different where you have some proton proton going on to z's which decay into muons so it's actually part of the data set i give you for optimization but on top you allow for additional chats possibly and i will show you the plots in a bit so um, as a spoiler here, I can say that you get much but better results, even without using like an MMD or something like that. And the training is much more stable. And you can also combine this nicely, that's also what we did here, with a Bayesian flow in order to also get error bars on it. The second example, which I rather use now to shortly explain, is the idea of unfolding. Well, let's assume you have some detector level, for instance, invariant mass. Which looks something like this. Let's put a debt to it. And we know that if we apply, so if, let's go like, if we would unfold this, so on parton level without detector smearing, we would actually have some sharp feature like this. But this is very common because we know that at the LHC, the Higgs peak is at the level of GV, GV, even though we know or we think that's something we still need to measure or figure out, that the natural width of the Higgs is around MeV. But there's no way to resolve that. So this is detector simulation. No, sorry. This is detector simulation. And the idea would be to take our data and go the other way around. So that's unfolding. So the question is, how do you do that? So what you're interested in, so the natural, so the ansatz for a standard detector simulation is you have some cross section on detector level, and that's correlated to some cross section of on parton level by some function. Which we call transfer function. Of course, the other way around would be, now you want to do unfolding, so you're interested in your parton level distribution. Given you measure detector level, and one you have the other way around. Which is the unfolding stack. And of course, these things should be normalized, which means if you, for instance, um, integrate out like this, 
we should get out a delta distribution. So now on the end of the day, because we said both detector simulation and unfolding should be a stochastic process, so it should happen with a certain probability, what we're actually interested in is not just a transfer function, we're actually interested in a conditional likelihood. So we're interested in the probability to measure X detector given a certain pattern level, which would be the, the, the detector level direction, and the other correspondence, we're interested in a likelihood to measure a pattern level um, event given a detector level event. Okay? Now, assuming this, of course, we can just directly try to learn this. And like we did it here with the likelihood, we can also try to parameterize this into something we, we know. So instead, so we interest, this is our XP we're interested, conditioned on XD. So we try to represent it as some latent space conditioned on XD and the corresponding Jacobian. Because that's the probability we're interested in. What this effectively means, we have a normalizing flow which has some latent, which has some random numbers here which are needed because we have a stochastic um, process. Uh, sorry. And this is conditioned on the detector level. So now the training goes like this. We have some training data of pairs of detector level and pattern level events which are connected to each other. So we train in this direction, trying to match our latent space, which is also now conditioned on detector level. And then for unfolding, we take detector level events and unfold them in this direction with additional noise. Because of course it should be stochastic, which means if you have once uh, detector level event and we unfold several times, we don't want to have the same output, right? So that's the idea. And that's a good thing because now we can sample it. And now I can show you the plots. Three minutes should be enough, then can we all head to the to lunch? Okay, so this is the event generation bit I just shortly mentioned. It's kind of the same, the same distribution that I showed earlier, um, just here that we also included an additional bar to actually see at what level of precision we are. And on top of truth, which just means we have like a, a billion of points to make sure there's no a lot of the stochastic variance in it. Compared to the INN, we also put a truth um, stochastically independent sample in it, which has the same, uh, same number of points, which means we sampled 1 million of uh, events from our flow, which is here the INN, which means it's the, it's the fast variant, where I'm fast in training and sampling. And compared to the training, also with 1 million points, to see how much of the precision we have stochastically dominated. And you can nicely see that within this line, we, we nicely match our training data at the same level of precision. And of course, as you expect for going further in the tail, the precision goes down just naturally because it have less training data there and less information to extract. Here, this is the invariant mass, which you also saw before. Of course, you see the quality is not as good if you especially look in those two panels. But if you remember how it looked for the gun without the MMD, which was essentially something like this, with much, much better improvements. And again, in principle, we could have also implemented here on top an MMD, but in a way, it's a solved problem. We didn't insist it to do so. We wanted to see what's the performance without doing this trick. And we see the performance is much better. Is it pattern level or detector level? Pardon? Is it 
Um, that's the tactile level, I think. Uh, after puzzle sharing and delves. Yeah, and then you can, in principle, can also do the same thing with Bayesian neural networks. Then you can see, if you look at the left plot and the right plot, compared to before that the error bars got bigger, which is now because on top of the pure statistical error bars, we also get the error bars from the training of the neural network. Unfortunately, making a network Bayesian is not always a good thing because sometimes this regularization terms limits the expressivity of a network, which you can see in the invariant mass, where you actually get both not a very good density plus the error estimation is also wrong. So what you would have expect is that at least if the density is wrong, the error would be large. But here it actually fails. And then last but not least, um, there's some, this is unfolding thing. Um, so if you do this, the left-hand side is not really important because I didn't have time to go into that. But here's the unfolding I meant for a single detector level event and you do th multiple unfoldings. This is the ex ex actual part from truth you would expect. <coughs> Bless you. And in principle, you can do the same thing with a fully conditional gun. But there, because you don't have any expression of log likelihoods, you cannot really make sure that you keep the stochasticity, which means, first of all, well, it doesn't really get the mean correctly, but this can happen. That's OK. But it also has no, no, no width. So it's essentially always the same point. It kind of, even though, also for the GAN, we were feeding in random numbers, it kind of just learned to ignore it, which cannot happen in the flow, because there, the random number or the, the, the random number part is part of the actual mapping and not of the condition, which means it cannot ignore it because of the bijectivity. And there you can see in this conditional INN, it kind of gets the peak right, but it also has a nice variance which matches our expectation. This other option here was a different idea where we didn't try to use a conditional INN, but rather directly mapping the detector on parton level, but then we of course had to extend each side with additional noise in order to match the dimensions, which is of course in the condition not a problem because the condition can have any dimension as you like, completely unrelated to the actual mapping between your other, the lower part. So there you can see it works out very, very nicely. And this calibration curve, maybe it still makes a bit sense. We have this one minute, hopefully. It tells you, it's kind of, if you look into certain quantiles of PT, let's mean, let's, quantile means if you have this entire PT distribution, you can split it up in different regions depending on how much of it contribute to the entire integral. And then you check how many fraction of events are in there. It should be, if it's doing it correctly, perfectly calibrated, should be on the line. Of course, for the GAN, because it's just a deterministic mapping, it just maps everything completely wrong. It completely misses it. And the INS, condition INN is kind of very nicely on this, on this diagonal, so it's very nicely calibrated. And really, this really means it gives us a nice conditional probability as we expect it. So we can really interpret it in statistically, which then is also useful for experiments. Yes, so we're slightly over time, just two minutes, but that's the end. Um, yeah, we're going to continue tomorrow with anomaly detection building up on some stuff you already know, but I will also repeat it. And we're done for today from my side. <laughs>